Hello and welcome to this evening's Science for All Seasons talk. The Science for All Seasons series gives you a chance to explore hot topics in genomics and biology with leading experts from the Broad Institute. My name is Tom Ulrich, and I'm the Associate Director for Science Communications at the Broad. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening and to introduce our speaker, human geneticist and genomic medicine researcher, Heidi Rehm. Heidi wears a number of hats. At Broad, she is an Institute member, co-director of the program in medical and population genetics, medical director of the clinical research sequencing program, co-lead of the Center for Mendelian Genomics, and a principal investigator of the Broad LMM Color All of Us Genome Center. At Massachusetts General Hospital, Heidi is the Department of Medicine's Chief Genomics Officer and faculty of the Hospital Center for Genomic Medicine. In addition, She is also a professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School, co-leader of the Matchmaker Exchange, and vice chair of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And I don't know when she sleeps. <laughs> so Heidi will talk about the ways in which researchers and clinicians around the world are leveraging the vast amounts of genetic data produced today to change the lives of millions of patients around the world and also find the causes for some of the rarest diseases. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to note that tonight's talk is also the 2022 Eliana Hector Memorial Lecture, delivered in honor and memory of Eliana, who is a gifted MD-PhD student and member of the Broad community. And I want to extend our welcome to her family and loved ones who are joining us virtually this evening. If you have questions for Heidi, please ask them using YouTube's chat feature, and we'll do our best to discuss them during the Q&A portion of the evening. And if you happen to be tweeting, we ask that you use the hashtag BroadSFAS. Over to Heidi. Thank you, Tom. Note to self, get rid of some titles. Uh, no, but anyway, I'm really pleased to be able to speak tonight um, on the topic of what will it, make it, what, what will it take to make clinical genomics part of everyday medicine. Uh, really a topic near and dear to my heart. And I hope to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in this space and some perspectives on what it will actually take to get there. So I thought um, I would talk about where we are today with the use of genetics in clinical medicine. And I wanted to sort of articulate that we use genetics in medicine in two major contexts. One is in what we call diagnostic testing, where individuals are symptomatic, they're expressing clinical manifestations of disease. Um, and when we see certain features, whether it be uh, a defect in the heart or uh, chronic kidney disease, something that we can observe clinically, we can then test for specific causes known to be related to that feature. So we can do that at any stage of life during prenatal testing, where we observe um, the fetus may have different abnormalities, or at the newborn state or pediatric state, or in adults uh, later on in life. And those may be in the form of um, identifying many different symptoms that might arise. In addition, we can do what we call screening tests or preventive genomics, where we're looking for risk for disease in someone who is asymptomatic and not yet manifesting any evidence of disease. We can do that also at many different stages. We can do that preconception where we might be doing carrier screening. Is mom or dad or future mom or dad carrying a recessive allele that when combined with a allele from the other parent leads to a child who inherits both copies of a variant and may manifest disease. We can also do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where we're looking for genetic defects in an embryo and only selecting those without the defect to implant. Uh, we can also do what is called NIPT or non-invasive prenatal testing where we can screen for major chromosome, like major genetic changes that are circulating in the blood of the mother um, from the fetus, um, and it's a non-invasive approach to find certain genetic abnormalities. We also include genetic approaches when we do newborn screening to look for certain metabolic diseases is often most common in newborn screening. And then we can screen for things that onset in adult life, like risk for cancer or heart disease or later onset neurological disorders. We can also test for variants in genes that relate to the metabolism of drugs so that we can figure out which drugs might work 
for a certain condition and which might not, or which might give you an adverse reaction um, or not. So those are the ways we use genetics today, but they're still not used highly commonly, and that's what we're trying to move towards. Um, and I thought I'd um, give you some examples and talk a little bit about this space. First, a definition. Some people often talk about a disease gene. It's a little bit of a misnomer because, in fact, the genes that lead to disease are actually normally function ge functioning genes in our body, and it's only when they're disrupted that it leads to disease. So, so it's not really correct to say, I have the disease gene in the sense that you have a gene that's different than someone else. Everybody has that gene but yours may be disruptive, disrupted, putting you at risk. I'll also say that a small number of the more common rare diseases make up a large fraction of patients affected with disease. So you may have heard of some of these disorders like sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, genetic hearing loss, hereditary breast cancer, Fabry disease. These are some of the more common rare diseases but in fact, most rare diseases, and there are over 7,000 of these, are actually individually each very, very rare. Um, um, also, rare diseases can onset at any stage in life. So rare diseases are the most common cause of infant, infant mortality. Um, also, about one in 100 children are born with hearing loss, and about half of those cases are due to genetic causes. Also, about 18% of children have a neurodevelopmental disorder like autism or global developmental delay, um, and a large fraction of those are due to genetics. About 5% of breast cancer is hereditary, um, and it can be passed from generation and generation and put people at much higher risk than the average individual who might develop breast cancer. Also, Cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death under age 35. Again, this is due to a dominantly inherited genetic disorder that shows up in every generation. So these are just examples of rare diseases, but collectively are actually quite common in our population. Unfortunately, when we try to look at an individual who has a rare disease and is manifesting symptoms, only about a quarter of the time do we actually find the cause, the specific genetic defect that's actually leading to their rare disease. And that's frustrating. Um, also, um, most genetic tests that are used in medicine are actually used for rare diseases. An exception is pharmacogenomics, um, but most of the genetic testing that's going on is in fact for rare diseases. Uh, the, probably the second most common use is in somatic cancer testing when a tumor is actually tested for genetics that might influence what drugs are used to treat that tumor. Um, but we're going to mostly focus on rare disease. Um, and in the US, uh, the definition of rare disease is a disease that impacts fewer than 200,000 people. So that's somewhat arbitrarily defined. Uh, and in fact, other countries have their own definitions, although they're all about the same. They're really trying to define rare diseases. Ours was defined in the US as under fewer than 200,000, and it relates to the Orphan Drug Act and certain privileges that companies get when they're addressing a rare disease in terms of therapeutic development. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, although each rare disease is quite rare, hence the name, in fact, collectively about one in 10 people have a rare disease. So that's 30 million people in the US or 400 million people worldwide. So it's really the global burden of rare diseases is quite significant. Um, and most rare diseases are in fact caused by defects in a single gene or so-called monogenic disease. Um, I won't have time to sh show a few videos that I've put into this talk, but since this is being recorded and broadcasted, um, I did put links to a couple of stories for those of you who want to follow up and listen to a, a few more patient-centered stories about what we call the diagnostic odyssey, where families with a child with rare disease or an individual with rare disease could go many, many years trying to find an answer as to why they have the symptoms they have. Uh, and that can be quite frustrating, but also quite rewarding when we actually discover the cause. And you can see mom here quite excited uh, in this particular story about Hannah um, when we did, in fact, discover the cause of her rare disease.
So I told you we only can solve about 25% of these cases. So how do we find the remaining causes of rare disease? First, I want to give you a sense of, well, how is it today that we actually figure out anybody's cause of disease? What do we do? Well, we typically sequence the DNA in an individual. And I need to sort of explain the difference in the types of tests we run. Sometimes we run a DNA test that just examines a single gene. For example, if an individual has sickle cell anemia, the cause of that disease is one variant in one gene, and we just need to test for that one. Other diseases uh, are due to variants in a number of different genes, but we know some of those genes, and we can test for just that panel of genes. Um, and when we do that, we're testing just about the percentage of that little yellow dot at the bottom in terms of the percentage of our DNA in our genome that we're actually looking at. It's a very small fraction. Uh, and in fact, when we just sequence that little bit, which is around about half a million bases of DNA, if we're sequencing up to 500 genes, we typically find between one and 500 variants or differences between your genome and uh, what we call a reference genome, sort of the typical genome. Um, and so those changes, those variants, are what we're carefully scrutinizing to figure out if any of them are actually might be leading to disease, or what we call pathogenic, meaning cause disease, versus most of the variants in our genome are what we say are benign. They don't lead to disease. Now, sometimes we, you have a bunch of different symptoms, and we can't specifically target a single disease where we know what genes to look at, and so we might want to sequence all of the genes. And we can do that in two different ways. We can do what's called an exome sequencing test, and that's equivalent to this green blob down here, where we're sequencing just the coding sequence of genes, the, the material that leads to making the proteins. Um, and that's about 30 million bases of DNA. Uh, we have about 20,000 genes in our genome. It also generates about 20,000 variants per person, a lot of variants to look at. Um, or we can sequence the whole genome. Here we're looking at all of the genes plus all the DNA between the genes. And that, as you can see, that's the size of this whole blue circle. It's three billion bases of DNA. And we find about three to five million variants in each person. So that's a lot of variants to sift through when we're trying to figure out the one, or maybe two if it's a recessive disease, um, that might be causing a particular disorder in an individual. So how do we find the needle in the haystack or the causal variant in the genome? Well, we go through these filtering steps where we start with, if we're sequencing the whole genome, start with three to five million variants. And the first step is we get rid of all those variants that are common in the population. Because if most people in the population have that variant, it can't be by definition causing a rare disease. And we um, at the Broad Institute maintain the NOMAD database where we collect data from thousands of people around the world and their genomes, and we can figure out which variants are common and which are rare. So that gets rid of a lot of stuff. Step two is we look at variants that look suspicious. Well, what does that mean? Well, they might be de novo. Those are variants that newly arise in a generation that weren't passed from the parents. Those are actually fairly rare events. In an individual with disease, if we find them in a gene that correlates with disease, that's very suspicious. So we'll look at de novo variants. We also might look at variants that someone else has already reported as disease causing. And we have this great database that lots of clinical labs share their data into that defines these variants that somebody else has already studied and shown to be pathogenic or disease causing. Or step three, we might look at variants in those specific genes that have already been linked to the symptoms in the individual. Um, and so if this person has a heart condition, we could look at our GenCC database, or our Gene Curation Coalition database, where we've cataloged all of the genes and their role in different diseases and how much evidence there is there. So these are ways that we can filter down from many, many variants to hopefully just a handful that we can really study. Um, now I'm going to show you some real um, families. Uh, but to do that, I need to draw some pedigrees. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with the pedigree, I just threw up from the internet an example pedigree. Um, and let's say that this is you or this is me. Um, this is just showing relationships and families. So this is a sibling, my brother, my dad, my mom. So circles are women, 
squares are men, um, and children are in branches under a, a married couple that are connected by a line. So, and this happens to be a pedigree showing left-handed traits. So sometimes you, and, and what we're showing when we shade in is those affected with whatever trait or disease we're studying. That's just your, your primer on um, how we uh, draw pedigrees. So here's the first pedigree. Um, and I should say these are real stories, although we've changed the names for privacy protection. So this is Carlos. He's a 40-year-old male with shortness of breath and chest pain. Uh, and when looked at on a cardiac ultrasound, was shown to have a thickened heart wall. Well, this is pretty classic uh, for a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You may remember I mentioned that was a disease that is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in individuals under 35. You most often hear about it when a professional athlete dies, although this disorder affects many others than just professional athletes. Um, now, most of the causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, are specific genes that lead to changes in the heart muscle. But there's a few uh, genes that when having defects actually leads to a disease that mimics hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One of those is a disease called Fabre disease. And in fact, in this particular family with this uh, individual who was affected with a thickened heart, when we did genetic testing for all the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genes, as well as the Fabry disease gene, knowing that it often mimics this disease, we actually found a variant in the GLA gene for Fabry disease. Why is this important? It's important because that particular gene, unlike most of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genes, has a treatment. It's called an enzyme replacement treatment where we can put the defective enzyme, a normal copy, back in the individual and restore that enzyme function. And that can reduce the symptoms, which are not only cardiac disease, but also renal and neurological in this particular disorder, unlike the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Equally important for the use of genetics is that now we know what the variant is, and we can specifically test for that variant in other family members who haven't yet manifested symptoms. That includes this individual's three children. This is an X-linked disorder, um, and so dad will pass it on to all of his daughters. Um, and they, uh, in fact, did test positive as we expected. But these two children can now receive treatment before the onset of symptoms and potentially pre prevent any onset of disease. That's the goal that we really are trying to strive for in genomic medicine. Here's another story, and this one is really around this preventive genomic screening. So this is a baby that was tested as part of our BabySeq study done in collaboration with Robert Green's group. And in this case, um, we actually were sequencing the exome of a newborn who had a disorder called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. It's a very serious cardiac condition. And in fact, sadly, this child died at seven and a half weeks. However, because we sequenced an entire exome, unlike the prior case where we just looked at those cardiac genes, here we sequenced the whole exome, and as a result, we were able to look at genes not only related to their heart condition, but in fact, other genes that put people at risk for other diseases like cancer. Um, and in this case, we found a um, BRCA2 variant, which is one of the genes involved in hereditary breast cancer. Now, when we identified that particular variant um, in the baby, we also had tested the parents and found that mom had it. Now, a medical geneticist had taken a three-generation pedigree very diligently to collect all of the family history of disease and did not identify a family history of breast or ovarian cancer. However, when we returned this result to mom, she said, oh, well, you know, it turns out that my father's mother died of ovarian cancer, and I have some relatives who died of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. In fact, there was a strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer. It had not come to light when a medical geneticist took a family history of this uh, individual. But upon this genetic result getting returned, this highlighted this risk, and the mom had a prophylactic mastectomy, which significantly reduces her rest, risk of serious outcomes from hereditary breast cancer. So just an example of the benefits of using genomics in not only diagnostics, but also in prevention.
I'll also talk about a few um, cases from our Rare Genomes Project. This is a project where we enroll families from across the U.S. Um, who, haven't, who have a suspected genetic disorder but have not gotten a diagnosis. No one's figured out why they have that particular disease. And on this plot, um, the, you can't see, there is a picture of the United States here. It's a little hard to see, but the blue dots are families that we've enrolled, and the orange dots are families where we have found the answer and returned the result to that family. So we're making good progress, and I'll show you a few stories from, from Rare Genomes Project cases. Uh, this is um, Sarah, shall we call her, a woman with infertility due to an oocyte maturation defect. Um, her eggs don't develop properly. And in fact, her sister had offered to donate an egg, but had the same defect. And so these are the two sisters with the defect. The physician declined to pursue further egg donation, figuring this whole family must have this genetic disorder, uh, but no genetic testing had been done. And this woman was desperate to have a child and not sure if her other sister could donate. So she enrolled in our study. We sequenced her genome and we identified variants in the TUB8 gene. Um, and this gene had already been associated very specifically with oocyte maturation defects leading to female infertility. Now we did discover, because we tested her parents, that this variant came from her father. However, being specific to oocytes, which are only found in females, this um, condition is restricted to females, so it didn't impact the father and his ability to have three daughters. Um, and that result, we returned it to this family, and now those sisters can get testing and figure out, we don't yet know, this is a reason finding, if that third sister is positive or negative, but if she's negative, she'll be able to donate eggs to her sister. Um, here's another story. This is about Camilla and Diego. These two children um, have microcephaly, oops, that's, there's an error. It's not enlarged, it's smaller, um, macrocephaly enlarged. Um, but they have um, small heads, seizures, global developmental delay, and they're non-ambulatory, can't walk. Um, and we found two variants in a gene called PPIL1. One of the variants came from mom and one came from dad, so this is an example of a recessive disorder where both copies of the gene need to be affected. Um, but unfortunately, variants in this gene had never before been linked to disease. So we couldn't prove that these variants, because I told you, we found variants in every gene all over the genome. So how can we prove that these variants are actually explaining the disease in these two children? So when we find variants in a novel gene, we need to find other families around the world to build the evidence base that this gene is actually implicated in that disease, uh, in this case, a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so what we do is something called gene matching, uh, and this is an approach we developed about seven years ago now. Um, and the idea here is we might have a child in some place on the globe with a particular rare disease, um, and we need to find another child somewhere around the world with a similar disease and the same gene implicated. So what happens is we can enter the gene, let's call it gene D, into a database, and we want to match and find somebody else that has a defect in that same gene and that the phenotype or the symptoms or clinical features are the same or similar across the two individuals. This is called genomic matchmaking. And we launched a platform now seven years ago um, where we connect rare disease databases around the world. In fact, this platform called the Matchmaker Exchange connects databases um, and data across 98 countries using eight different nodes of this platform. Um, and through this, it's kind of like playing Go Fish. You put, you uh, enter your gene in along with your patient's um, clinical features, and you hit a button and you wait. And literally, in seconds to minutes, you can get a result back that said, you have a match, um, and then we can correspond between the other uh, submitter who submitted their gene and case and see how close the phenotype matched to see if it's a real match. This whole process has now been done thousands of times, and in fact, thousands of novel genes have been discovered using this platform called Matchmaker Exchange. And here's the story, the, the rest of the story with Camilla and Diego. So we put this family and their gene into Matchmaker Exchange, and we matched 
uh, with another lab, Joe Gleason, who had already found and matched seven other cases of families who also had similar disease in all seven families to our family. And he even made a mouse model that showed the similar features like a small head and other things in the mouse model. And that was what allowed us to build the evidence and prove that this gene is related to this disease. And in fact, those two variants are causal in that family. Um, and I added another story from another family. This is Justin's Odyssey, um, using the matchmaker exchange as well. And it's a real um, powerful story. And I encourage you to, to listen to this story in your own time. Um, so, so those are some terrific stories. One of the challenges is even when we've figured out the genes that correlate disease and we can test for those specific genes, we find all these variants. I told you all the variants we keep finding in these individuals. And unfortunately, we can't interpret much of the variation we find in the genes that we discover or link to disease. Um, and this has even become a challenge. There's even been lawsuits suing labs for you know, potentially interpreting variants not correctly. Um, and this is a news article from, um, and I'll tell you about this story. This is the story of Christian Williams, uh, who is in the news. You can look up this story. Um, Christian had seizures and developmental delays since he was four months of age. His neurologist had referred him to a specialist who ordered genetic testing. And there was a variant of uncertain significance return in the SCN1A gene, um, which is associated with Dreve syndrome. Um, that report recommended parental testing and said if this variant is found to be de novo, so absent from the parents, that would be good evidence to reclassify it. Unfortunately, that subspecialist did not follow up, did not test the parents, and did not set, share those results with either the family or the neurologist that, who referred um, the family to him. Um, and unfortunately, that ne neurologist, as a result, continued treating Christian with increasing doses of carbamazepine, uh, which is used to treat seizures in general, but for this specific form of seizures due to Dravé syndrome, is actually thought to worsen the seizures. And in fact, in January 2008, Christian died of a severe seizure. Um, and so it could have been related to that drug and the fact that he may have had Dravé syndrome due to this variant. Um, now, the family wanted to sue the doctor for not following up on this result, but it had been too much time. So they decided to sue the lab for incorrect variant classification because they had um, evidence that the lab actually had published the variant as pathogenic, yet wrote a report that said uncertain, but there's a lot of professional judgment interpreting variants, and in fact, the case was dismissed because it is so challenging to interpret variants. So, What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is we need to do a lot of work to try to figure out whether variants cause disease or not. And uh, because these variants are so rare, we have to do this collectively as a community. And that brings me to the ClinGen program, which stands for Clinical Genome Resource. Uh, and this is a consortium of people sharing data, developing standards, curating knowledge. All of that information goes on our website, clinicalgenome.org. And it's really meant to define the clinical relevance of genes and variants so we can use them in medicine and research. Now, when we classify variants as a community, uh, uh, and we have many people doing this, we can put them in a database called ClinVar, which is a database where labs share their classified variants with the community. Or the genes that we classify, we can put them in a database called GenCC, where we share our classifications of genes and their relationship to disease. Very important databases. Um, but I'll just give you a sense of the challenge ahead of us. Most variants that we find in genes are rare. We, we each have about 200 rare coding sequence variants um, that we you know, have a trouble interpreting. Uh, and most of the evidence is often unpublished or inaccessible. It's based on de novo occurrence in a family that doesn't get published on, and that's evidence is not uh, accessible. It takes about an hour per variant. Um, so we have hundreds of these that we have to interpret in each person in genes that are suspicious looking. So in this database, we actually have um, so far in ClinVar 2.4 million classified variants. So we've come a long way with data sharing. That's a great start, but we still have many more millions to go. Um, and in fact, 
Over 63,000 of these variants have conflicting classifications. And in fact, the largest fraction, 36% of variants in ClinVar, are of uncertain significance. So some of them we understand, and we call them pathogenic or benign, but others we don't understand. So we still have more work to do uh, in figuring this out. Also, I talked to you about certain genes that have been implicated in disease, like that PPIL1 gene that we implicated in a neurodevelopmental disorder. Well, papers get published on gene disease relationships, and sometimes there's good evidence, and sometimes there's not. So the ClinGen program and its expert panels of disease experts have been curating um, gene disease relationships uh, that have been published in the literature. And um, what we found is that of the 1,804 gene disease relationships curated so far, and these little circles are across many different diseases that they've been studying, um, only about 75% of those publications have valid evidence to really document that gene's involvement in disease. And about a quarter don't have enough evidence yet. Again, highlighting some of the challenges in our field. Um, this is a map of all of the almost 1,900 people around the world that are participating in these expert panels, helping curate the knowledge that will allow us to apply genetics to the practice of medicine. So over 95 different expert panels um, working together around the world in lots of different disease areas like cardiovascular disease and hearing loss and cancer and neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, also, in addition to sharing those variant classifications and the evidence, we also need to share the primary data, the genomes that we sequence on individuals. Uh, and this is a story um, that I shared with a reporter from The Atlantic a number of years ago um, about a family that we tested. They actually, it was a pregnant couple, um, and their baby had a increased nuchal translucency measurement. That's a little space behind the neck that can be measured. And when it's enlarged, it's associated with certain genetic disorders. One of those is a disorder called Noonan syndrome. And um, the doctor ordered a test for Noonan syndrome, and we found a variant of uncertain significance. Now, that variant had been reported in the literature as pathogenic, and we were doing our research on it. And this variant was found in an individual of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And so it's really important to search out variants in the same populations that you found that in to figure out if it's just simply common. and We can rule it out as disease causing. And in fact, there was a data set from that population that I had asked to get access to just so we could interpret this case. And those researchers didn't share that data set. They weren't ready to share it yet. And so we didn't have access. We reported the variant as path or likely pathogenic based on the, the publication. Um, and then later, um, that family terminated that pregnancy. And later, we found out that in that very data set we didn't have access to, the variant was very common and ruled out the variant as pathogenic. And it was actually benign. So this was an error in inter It wasn't an error. It was simply we didn't have the evidence. It hadn't been shared. So it really highlights the critical importance of sharing data and we all have a role and responsibility to that. If you partake in a research study and your genome is sequenced, I encourage you to share that so others can benefit from that knowledge. Now, one of the challenges um, with doing this is, um, is the standards we use to sequence genomes and catalog variants and be able to share it. And so we have an organization called the Global Alliance that is developing the standards and how we share data, making sure that data is secure and people's privacy is protected. And this video that I don't have time to show you, but I encourage you to watch online, will help teach you about how we can get pieces of data from around the world and bring them together to use that to understand genes and variants and their role in human health and disease. Now that organization, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, is, is organization that has different work streams that develop standards in different areas. Like how do we discover information? How do we share it? How do we store it in the cloud? How do we secure it? What are the standards for curating the knowledge around it? And we do that by working closely with research and clinical programs that are the driving projects that need these standards, need this data. And we work back and forth between our work streams and our driving projects to help develop the standards we need to share data around the world and make use of that to help interpret variants and deliver genomic medicine.
And to that point, the very last section of my talk is that really, really on the front edge of delivering that genomics to patients. And so when I um, came to MGH now four years ago to become the chief genomics officer, it was really around forming a unit to figure out what the barriers to actually delivering genomic medicine to patients were. And we met with a lot of clinicians in this list here are all the different specialties and a representative one or more from each specialty that is part of our genomic medicine implementation team um, and a few core members of that team really working to identify barriers and break them down. And what were the barriers we identified? Well, many of the physicians said we have a lack of genetic counselors and, and support for test ordering. We can't get genetic results integrated into electronic health record. Um, we're not using genetics in primary care almost at all. And we have a lot of patients that come to us and say, I think I'm at risk for cancer, and we don't know where to send them because they don't actually have cancer and they can't go to the oncologist. How do we serve these patients? So we've been working to really break down these barriers, assist those clinics in launching genomic medicine. Here's a great example, Andrew Lundquist, uh, a, a wonderful nephrologist um, who wanted to set up genetic services for his renal clinic. And in the first year when we helped him set up those services, provide the genetic counselor support, uh, he was able to show that half of the cases he sent genetic testing uh, for had clinically useful results. Here's just one of those individuals, a 48-year-old female, May, with chronic kidney disease and hypertension. Um, genetic testing showed a mutation in the UMOD gene. Um, and it turns out that that confers a specific diagnosis and we identified the variant, which means we could test family members. This is particularly important because when you have chronic kidney disease and your kidneys fail, you can get a donor from a related individual often so that they're a match, but you need to avoid a donor who has the same genetic disease that you have. So you need to figure out what the defect is so you can rule it out. And in fact, by finding that defect, um, Andrew was able to show that the sister was negative and therefore was cleared for kidney donation to her sibling. So this is an example of how we use genetics in other ways. Um, now I mentioned that one of those of the four top barriers was dealing with those individuals in the hospital who were asymptomatic but at risk for disease. And so to try to help that patient population, we launched the Preventive Genomics Clinic now a couple years ago. Um, and in the first 209 patients, um, we were able to um, order genetic testing on about 77% of those patients, 80% of whom paid nothing for genetic testing because they actually met professional guidelines for risk for which the genetic testing costs were covered. Um, and that's a really important factor. We're starting to see better coverage of uh, specific tests uh, for different indications where they are warranted and there's good evidence. So we're, we're continuing to see patients in this clinic. However, um, Leland Hall is the primary care physician that, that sees patients in this clinic and our genetic counselors can't see the hundreds of individuals a month that have risk. So how do we start to disseminate more broadly? Uh, and so we launched an e-consult service within um, the MGH hospital, working with other physicians so we could direct genomics questions to the appropriate specialty and often service the primary care physicians who had questions. A woman shows up in clinic and says, gee, my sister died of breast cancer and my mother had breast cancer. Am I at risk? Should I get tested? And often those primary care physicians aren't well um, trained to be able to answer those questions. So we can help answer those questions by typing the question into an e-consult. Our team returns an answer, and not only do we help with that case, but we help educate so that they can apply that same knowledge to subsequent cases. That's where the e-consult becomes a broader approach to scaling genomics, particularly to address needs in primary care where there's so many different uh, indications coming. And we actually studied the outcomes of those first 100 e-consult um, services where we were able to track that um, uh, 31 had a recommended genetic evaluation. Um, six, there were non-genetic labs recommended or discouraged genetic testing. So sometimes those questions don't lead to a recommendation for a genetic cause of disease or testing. Um, sometimes we helped interpret existing genetic test results or advised on a screening plan or decided the referral was no longer needed 
or that a family member should get testing first who actually had disease as opposed to the at-risk individual. All ways that we are helping educate and disseminate how to approach genomic medicine. So with that, I'm gonna stop and really just review the sort of the, the final part of this, which is what are the critical elements to making clinical genomics part of everyday medicine? So one is the availability of affordable genetic testing. We're actually getting there. Genetic tests are much cheaper than they were years ago. We're also, uh, I told you the challenges of interpreting genetic information. And we are making headway on building accurate genomic knowledge bases to assist in the genetic testing. We also need a rich interface between research and clinical applications so that genomic information is coming together, shared, and we can use that to further advance our knowledge of the genetic causes of disease. That will require global data sharing around the world. We need access to genetics in the clinic, both specialty clinics as well as primary care. We need access to preventive genomic testing at all stages in life on a robust basis. And we need genetic counseling services to support those individuals and how to get genetic testing, what that information means for that individual and their family members. And we need to get this information into the electronic health record so that it can be used by all physicians caring for an individual patient. And with that, I want to acknowledge many people in my team, as well as many people around the world that are collaborating on a lot of the projects that I mentioned that really do most of the hard work. And I really appreciate their input uh, and the, the collaborative work um, with many other individuals around the world. And I think we'll stop there. And I think there's time for questions um, from, from the, the viewers. And, and, and Tom might even have some for me as well. So thank you very much. You know, you know me well, Heidi. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. We do have some questions. My colleague Alex has been monitoring the chat. And he's got a few that he's pulled together from there. But I wanted to start off with one really yeah. quickly. Uh, you said early on in the talk that it's only about 25% of rare disease cases that you're able to find a genetic cause. It, you may have already answered this with the list that you had just were showing a few minutes ago, but why is that? Why is it so hard? Is it the data sharing? Is it the lack of matchmaking? Or is it just a little bit of everything? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of everything. Um, I think some of the challenges, I, you know, I mentioned we find three to five million variants we're a little better at interpreting variants when they occur inside a gene. And the, the likelihood they're disrupting the gene's function is higher. Um, and so we have a little better ability to uh, interpret those variants. But even some of those, they just change one amino acid in a long string of amino acids. And a lot of those do nothing, and some do something. And we don't have good assays or tests to figure out if that missense or change in the amino acid is actually going to change the function. So we, we end up with these you know, variants that could cause disease, but we just don't know. And they sit there as candidates for a long time. The other challenge is this region. I mentioned when we sequence a whole genome that we also sequence the region between genes. There's a lot of regulatory um, regions that are controlling whether a gene gets expressed or not. Um, and we don't know a lot about how that process works. Uh, and which sequences are really important and when disrupted, turn off a gene or turn on a gene when it shouldn't be on. And those things are even harder to interpret. And we haven't even been sequencing whole genomes for that long. We've been mostly sequencing the coding sequence of genes in panels or exomes. So we're just starting. So we need more data so that we can learn from it and more tools and methods to actually functionally figure out if these variants have an effect or not. Alex, what have you been finding on the internet? What have people been asking? Yeah, we have a question from Zina who asks, one question I have is what advice would you have for an aspiring pediatric geneticist such as myself? I'm in my senior year of high school for reference. <laughs> well, I can tell you that one inspiring message is the ability to, to work with a family who's been struggling with not knowing why they have certain features. Sometimes they're, they're asking, was it that glass of wine I had before I realized I was pregnant? That is the why my child has this or that. Uh, this is really challenging. And when we deliver an answer, uh, even if there's nothing that can be done but the answer alone, that can have huge emotional benefit to those families. Um, but even if there isn't a treatment yet developed for that disorder, 
it then allows that family to connect with other families. They learn from each other. Kids and adults are at different stages of disease. They learn what the future has in hold. They form foundations. They raise money. They can lead to, to research, treatments, registries. There's just so much that can be done, and it brings these communities together. Um, and the hope, and now we're having an increasing number of treatments that are actually developed because we're figuring out why people have these disorders. So it's an incredibly rewarding um, field of study in terms of genetics. Also, it's just really fun to understand how genes turn into functions in our body, and I've always loved that as a primary area of research as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we have some questions from beforehand as well. Are there diseases that, as you look across the generations of a family, get worse or better? Yes. Um, so there is a phenomenon called anticipation, and there are certain disorders where it actually gets worse over the generations. And the most common scenario for that is what we call um, triplet repeat expansions or short tandem repeats. So there's regions in the genome that are repetitive like a CTG, 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 hundreds of them in a row. And what happens is the enzyme that replicates DNA and makes copies of it as we go from an embryo, a single cell, to many cells, that has to replicate the DNA. When that happens and the DNA is trying to be replicated, it can stutter and slip on those repetitive regions, sort of losing track of how many it should be making. And it can expand and contract. When it, and what happens in generations, as it gets bigger, the chance that it gets really big go up. And so what happens is you'll have one individual with you know, a slightly expanded, and then it gets more expanded and more expanded. And the larger the expansion, the more severe the disease. And that's when you see this sort of anticipation or worsening over generations. Um, other things, you know, sometimes it's just what we call ascertainment bias. The most severe individual in the family just happens to come to clinical attention because they're very severe. Then you look back and say, well, actually, mom kind of had symptoms similar, and so did grandma. It's like, why did it get worse? It didn't actually. It's just randomly diseases show up sometimes more severe and sometimes less severe. But sometimes it's the person who came to clinic because it was so severe, and then you look back and like, oh, yeah. So that's more just sporadic. We, many diseases can sometimes show up more severe and sometimes less severe. But there are certain genetic disorders like these repeat expansions that very specifically do that. Lastly, um, another question that a lot of people might have, but let's say I get my genome sequenced by a 23 or me or ancestry or something like that. Is there a way to have someone like you look at my data? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I sell my service. No, not really. Uh, too much to do. Too many titles, right, Tom? Um, so so um, certain services like 23andMe, uh, Ancestry.com, they actually don't sequence whole genomes. They're actually running what are called SNP arrays, where they're only sequencing common variants in the population, and then using that information to um, to determine your ancestry or whether you're lactose intolerant, some of the more common traits in the population. And they often don't have rare variants. Now, some of these platforms have included a few more of the more common rare variants, like 23andMe includes sequencing of the three most common variants for breast, hereditary breast cancer in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. <laughs> so for individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, you can get those three variants tested. But if you're negative, you have to be very careful because they're not testing the thousands of other hereditary breast cancer variants. Um, and so while it may detect a reasonable rate of risk in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, it is not assessing that risk very accurately for other populations and not even comprehensively with just three variants. So I, I, most of these platforms are not designed to sequence your whole genome and give you back a lot of comprehensive information. There are other um, places, however, that do sequence whole genomes and interpret them more broadly. 
Um, and um, sometimes you can take genomic information and bring it to another lab and get them to interpret. So there's lots of services out there. Sadly, I can't interpret them all for you, <laughs> nor can my team, but um, there are services out there to get your whole genome interpreted. All right, thanks, Alex. One other question that just came to mind was, you, know, we, you talked a lot about monogenic diseases, mm -hmm. you know, rare diseases yes. that are caused by a variant in a single gene. Are there cases of rare disease that are caused by variants in multiple genes? And how much yeah. harder is it to figure out the cause of those? Yes, so I didn't really talk about the more complex. So we have rare diseases, we have complex diseases that are called caused by variation in lots of different loci. And then we have things kind of in the middle that are we call oligogenic, um, where multiple different genes together might, you know, a handful, let's say. And, and autism is an example of a disorder that is not strictly monogenic. Um, you don't see it in every generation or strictly, you know, recessively or dominantly inherited. And often there are sometimes a handful of genes that are contributing to an individual who might develop autism. It certainly runs in families, and there's a higher risk of a sibling if one is affected, but it's not quite as strictly monogenic. Also, I, I already talked about some of the variability for individuals who might have a monogenic disorder running in their family, but then some individuals develop disease early and others later. Why is that? In fact, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a great example. It can be seen in children. It can be an uh, individual can go till they're 80 years old and not develop disease. What's the difference? And so in this case, there are both genetic, or often both genetic and non-genetic factors. So for instance, um, really stressing your heart like a professional athlete does can worsen hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and so many individuals who have this diagnosis are told not to exercise at a level that you can't hold a conversation because they don't want to stress the heart too much. That's an environmental cause of disease. Now, hypertension also is a stressor that's not good, so they don't want these people just sitting on the couch eating potato chips either, so it's sort of a balance there because um, you don't want to get overweight and stress your heart for other reasons. But there's also other genetic factors, and an example um, is with hereditary breast cancer, similar to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, some individuals may develop breast cancer early in life. Some individuals may go their whole life and not develop it. What's different? Well, we're starting to study more common variants in their con contribution disease and defining what we call polygenic risk scores. These scores take into account many variants in the genome, sometimes more common variants. And together, through statistics, we can identify a set of variants that make you at higher risk or lower risk for disease. And these are not very deterministic. These are slight changes in risk. But what we found is when you combine a polygenic risk score with a monogenic disease variant in a family with breast cancer, the higher polygenic risk score can make it more likely that you actually develop breast cancer due to the monogenic cause of disease. So it's modifying your risk and making you more likely or less likely to develop that disease. So this is where we start to see the interplay of common disease variants and rare disease variants coming together to inform why some people might get a disease and others might not. We have another question from online from Liz. Um, have you or your teams experienced any challenges related to mistrust of healthcare practitioners in marginalized communities such as indigenous populations? Absolutely, this is a challenge. Um, you know, I talk about the importance of sharing data, um, but there is definitely concerns, like where, what are you gonna do with my data? Where is it gonna go? Who's gonna get it? Are they gonna use it to discriminate against me? Uh, and these are important questions. Um, and um, the best thing that we can do is really be able to educate and inform why is it useful. That's where I share all these patient stories and talk about how this information was able to help a family and help get answers um, and develop trust in, in doing so and show how we don't use the information for bad things. But often, you know, that takes conversations, engagement, engaging members of the community that can act as spokespeople 
who are people that are trusted by those communities. So we have to actively engage. We can't just like send out on Twitter, hey, everybody sign up and send me your data. Like it doesn't work that way. It's really about engaging, it's about being partners. In fact, in our Rare Genomes Project, sometimes we find answers we're not 100% sure about, but we return those results back to the families. We explain what we understand, what we don't understand. And sometimes those families become partners in the research and working together with us to try to get other families, collect information, collect more clinical data, and together we can try to solve these answers. So I think the really important thing about developing trust is becoming partners in this process and helping teach each other how we can all benefit from a, a global shared environment. Gordon online also asks, how close are we to widespread whole exome sequent testing on asymptomatic people to look for potential health issues? That is a great question I get asked all the time. And every, you know, every five years I say, well, in about five years it'll happen. <laughs> so, you know, it's a magic question. I, I, I continue to say that probably within about five years, um, this will become fairly widespread. And, and for two reasons. One, the costs at some point will come down. We, we've actually, the costs came down dramatically over the years. And then for the last five or 10, it's been pretty flat. <laughs> um, but I still think we're, we're, the technology is now probably going through another iteration. And I anticipate another jump downward. Not only um, jump downward, but a recognition of the value of the information such that it may offset the cost of the actual technology that we're willing to invest. And you're starting to see major projects sequencing major populations like the UK Biobank, the All of Us Research Program sequencing a million individuals in the US. And in fact, there are cohorts being developed in biobanks around the world. So we're starting to generate this data mostly in a research context, but it's, it's being generated at scale because of the value of the information. So I actually, the question is what, who, who gets ahead, the healthcare system or the research program, right? Right now I'm betting on the research program because healthcare and particularly in the US has been fairly dysfunctional in terms of how we, um, we operate, unfortunately. That said, I do have hopes <laughs> that we will get there and that we will build a better system to be able to utilize this information and really be able to sequence an individual's genome at birth and then use that information over their lifetime as questions arise. Use it, you know, for preconception. Use it for, you know, newborn screening. Use it for deciding which drugs to treat with. Use it for determining risk. Use it for understanding symptoms as they arise. And I think um, we have a ways to go to build that infrastructure and knowledge base. But my guess is that within the next five years, we will start really widespread using genomic information. Thank you. That's all the questions we have online. I'll hand it back to Tom. And I, I didn't have anything else. So thank you so much again, Heidi. This is a fantastic talk. Uh, we hope all of you who are joining us tonight enjoyed this evening's talk. If you like what you heard, we can uh, ask you to consider watching the rest of the Science for All Seasons series and to uh, possibly join us again on November 15th when Broad researchers Paul Blaney and Alex Shalik will be joining us to talk about biological engineering. Uh, you can find all of these talks from the series at broadinstitute.org slash SFAS. A recording of tonight's talk will also be posted to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash user slash Broad Institute. Uh, to find out about other live streamed events and new videos from the Broad Institute, please consider subscribing and ask your family and friends to do so as well. Thank you again for joining us e this evening and have a great night. Thank you.